Welcome to Love and Money Secrets TV. I'm Dame Lillian Walker, your host, and today we get to dive in deep and get into Becoming Supernatural. We are at chapter 11. So we just have up until chapter 14 to complete this book, and I'm so excited to dive in deep into this chapter, which is space, time, and time space. So let's get started. So we live in a three-dimensional universe, uni meaning one, where everything that exists is made up of people, objects, places, and time. For the most part, it is a dimension of particles and matter. So through our senses, we experience these things as form, structure, mass, and density. If I placed an ice cube, your cell phone, or an apple pie in front of you, for example, you could not experience any of these objects without your senses. It's your senses that give rise to your experience of physical reality. So while the ice cube, cell phone, and apple pie all have height, width, and depth, they only exist to you because you can see, hear, taste, smell, and actually feel them. If you lost your five senses or they were simultaneously eliminated, you would be incapable of experiencing these physical objects because you would have no awareness of them. They would literally not exist to you because in this three-dimensional reality, you can't experience them without your senses, or can you? According to astrophysics, in this case, realm of three dimensions, the known universe, let's call it space-time reality, there's an infinite amount of space. So take a moment to ponder that concept. From the small perch where, you, where we sit staring out into the universe, when we look up at the sky, we see only a sliver of the universe. So it appears to us as infinite, and yet infinite is even bigger than that. So in other words, in the realm of space, time, space is eternal. It has no end and goes on forever. But what about time? The way you and I typically experience time is by moving our bodies through space. So for example, it might take you five minutes to set this book down, walk to the kitchen, pour a glass of water, and return. This occurs because a thought that originated in your mind created a vision of what you were going to do in the kitchen. You acted on that thought, and consequently, you experienced time by moving from one point to another through space. So before you walked to the kitchen, and as you were sitting in your chair, when you became conscious of the kitchen in relation to where you were sitting, you experienced a separation of two points of consciousness. So where you sat and the kitchen. To close that gap between those two points of consciousness, you moved your body through space and that took time. So it makes sense then that the greater the space or distance between two points, the greater time it takes to get from one point to another. So conversely, the faster the speed at which you travel between these two points, the shorter the amount of time it takes. So this measurement of time, of the time it actually takes for an object to move through space is the foundation for Newtonian physics or classical mechanics. So in the Newtonian world, if we know that certain properties about an object, such as its force, acceleration, direction, speed, and the distance it, it will travel, we can make time-based predictions, therefore. Newtonian physics is based on knowns and predictable outcomes. We can say then that when there's a separation between two points of consciousness, as you move from one point of consciousness to another point of consciousness, you are collapsing space. As a result of collapsing space, you experience time. So take a look at figure 11.1 .1 to further understand the relationship between space and time in our three-dimensional world. So here's another example. If I'm writing this book and I want to finish this chapter, it's going to take time. I may not have to move my body very much through space, but I still experience time. Why? 
because where I presently am in the process of writing this chapter represents one point of consciousness and finishing the chapter represents another. The completion of this chapter represents a future moment separate from the present moment. So the space between the closing of the gap between these two points in consciousness is the experience of time. So if you look again at figure 11.1, .1, again, it will help you gain a better understanding about time. So to achieve my desired goal of arriving at the end of chapter one, repeatedly have to do something. This requires me to use my senses to interact and move through my environment with a coordinated set of behaviors. And again, this takes time. So if I cease writing and I do something else, such as watch a movie, it's gonna take more time for me to reach my intended result. Therefore, to achieve my goal of completing this chapter, I must consistently align my actions to match my intention. So as we move through space from one point of consciousness to another point of consciousness, we experience time. So when we collapse space in our 3D world, time is created. In this material world of three dimensions, because we use our senses to navigate space, we place most of our attention on, a, on physical things such as people, objects, and places. They are all made of matter and they are localized, meaning they occupy a position in space and time. So these all represent points of consciousness from which we experience separation. For instance, when you observe your best friend sitting across the table from you or look at, a, at your car parked in a driveway, you notice the space between you and your friend in the car. Or as a result, you feel separate from them. So you are here and your friend or the car is over there. So in addition, if you have dreams and goals, then where you are in the present moment and where your dreams exist as a reality in your future also creates that experience of separation. It's safe to say then that in order for us to navigate this three-dimensional reality, we need our senses. So the more we use our senses to define reality, the more we experience separation. So because most of this three-dimensional reality is sensory-based, space and time create the experience of separation from everyone, everything, every place, and everybody in every time. So all things material occupy one position in space and time, and that's called locality in physics. So in this chapter, we're going to explore the contrast between two models of reality, space-time and time-space. Space-time is physical, Newtonian world-based unknowns, predictable outcomes matter, and the three-dimensional universe in which we live, which is made up of infinite space. Time-space is the non-physical quantum world an inverse reality based on unknowns, endless possibilities, energy, and the multidimensional multiverse where we also live, which consists of infinite time. So I'm gonna pause right here because I think this is a real critical distinction. And it's in the distinctions, it's in the little things that make all the difference in the world. So again, we're gonna review this. A lot of people don't know what Newtonian physics or what Newtonian science is. And it's like Newton's third law for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. There's a whole bunch of, you know, I think, uh, I don't know how many laws told. <laughs> no, I was a bio major, but I don't remember how many laws Newton has. But basically it is a science which the way Newtonian physics has been organized and articulated and taught what Newton Newton's whole obsession was be able to was he wanted to be able to predict reasonable outcomes based on certain knowns and that's why Dr. Joe here says space-time which is Newtonian is the physical 
Newtonian world based on knowns. So based on what you're exper experiencing with your five senses, your eyes, your ears, what you hear, smell, see, taste, and touch. Based on knowns predictable outcomes, which is matter, it's already in place, and the three-dimensional universe in which we live, which is made up of infinite space. Now, the, you know, we live in a, a world of polarity. So this, that's the first option, the Newtonian physics world. The second one is time-space. It's the other way around. So time space is non-physical. It's the quantum world, an inverse reality based on unknowns, endless possibilities, energy, and the multi-dimensional universe where we also live, which consists in infinite time. So to paraphrase this, this is the world of quantum. It's where everything exists in the waveform of energy. So looking at things and being aware as, as conscious beings, you know, this is our instrument and we're using our awareness to be aware that whatever exists in the 3D world is, is limited. But we also recognize as that awareness that in quantum, there are no limitations. Everything is infinite. And because we now understand and we recognize and we are aware, we're comprehending what science is now proving to us that at a subatomic level, everything that is not observed is all potential wave energy. That whether it's a molecule, whether it is an atom, whether it's a proton, neutron, electron, or it's an even smaller subatomic particle, we're looking at a quark, it's 99.9% .9 space. And what remains are the potential waveforms of energy. What they actually see are waveforms of energy. And as they observe the waveforms of energy, those waveforms by sheer fact of that scientist observing and looking at it, giving it attention, it starts to turn and you have waveforms along particles now start to come because some of the waveforms turn into particles. And the more you watch it, the more particles start to come together. Those waveforms of energy now start to coalesce, becoming more and more particles until you have enough particles and whatever it is that you're intending and focusing and looking to mold that energy into, you have enough particles that boom, then it turns into, it comes out into our 3D world. That's how a chair that whoever designed this chair thought of it. And as they continued to think and mull it over, then this chair ultimately then came out into 3D manifestation because then from the inner world, it came out onto paper, they drew it, then it was prototyped, then it was manufactured, and now here it is. That is the distinction between those two um, concepts. And I just wanted to make, make that clear. So moving on, I'm going to challenge your understanding and perception of the nature of reality, because if you're going to experience the mystery of self as a dimensional being, you're going to need a roadmap to get there. Stress and the consequences of living in the perpetual state of survival. So because we use our senses to observe and to determine physical reality, we identify as a body living in space and time, yet separate from everything in our environment. Over time, this interaction creates the experience of our identity. And throughout our lives, via the different interactions we have during certain times and places with people, things, and objects, our identity then evolves into a personality. So the quality of these interactions with our external environment creates lasting memories and these memories shape who we become. We call this process experience and it's life's experiences that shape who we are. And as you know, the majority of people's personality is based on past past experiences. So as you learned in chapter eight, to our brains, the material objects, things, people, places that we perceive daily occur to us in patterns. 
and the recognition of these patterns is called memory. If the self is created from memories of past experiences, then memories are based on knowns. Therefore, most of our three-dimensional world is based on knowns. This is where most of us focus our attention. When you align everything material in your external world with the memories from your past experiences, you recognize them as familiar. You are matching a physical reality with a set of neurological networks in your brain. This is called pattern recognition. And it's the process whereby most people receive and perceive reality through a lens of the past. So you're perceiving the now with a lens of the past. It's not necessarily accurate and it's not necessarily true, but it is colored by whatever your past has been. So if you've had a negative past, it's colored by dark glasses. If you've had a positive past, you know, you've heard of the expression, oh, she sees things through rose colored glasses. So we could say then that our materialists, or we could say then that we're materialists, not only living in this dimension, but also enslaved to and limited by or limited by it because we've defined ourselves as a body living in an environment at certain times. And our focus is more on matter and less on energy, the energy waveforms again. So from a, from a quantum perspective, we're keeping our attention on the physical particle, on matter, instead of the immaterial wave of possibilities, which is energy. This is how we become immersed in this three-dimensional reality. So when stress is thrown into the equation, our body begins to draw from the invisible electromagnetic field of energy around us to produce chemistry. The greater the frequency, intensity, and duration of the stress, the more energy our body consumes. So let's stop right here for a moment, because in the last chapter, we learned in chapter 10 about electromagnetic frequencies. And as we do meditations, how it fans out our electromagnetic frequency. And the formula is you're going to want to move the energy from all of your energy centers, your first, your second, your third, your fourth, your fifth, your sixth, your seventh, and ultimately your eighth. But when we are in fear, when we are in a fight or flight response, when we have anxiety, and an anxiety attack, a panic attack, any kind of nervous disorder, uh, when you're in worry or hurry, when you're freaking out, when you're all you know jacked up in a negative way, all the energy from any center above your third is, you don't have any energy for it to go up. It is now reserved in your first, your second, and your third energy center. As we learned before, the first energy center is at the base of your spine, at your perineum. The second is two inches below your belly button. The third is two inches above your belly button, which is also known as your solar plexus. And because you are in a fight or flight response, you are under, you know, your body is now producing a great amount of cortisol. Your body is also producing a great amount of adrenaline because it has to get ready for a burst of energy for you to bolt. Because in the olden days, it was fearing that a saber-toothed tiger, a bear, you know, a pterodactyl, whatever was going to come at you and eat you. And so you had to be able to bolt. And in order to preserve the, you know, the most important part of your body is your internal organs. You can live without an arm or a leg. You cannot live without half of your torso. So in order to preserve this, which is the most important part of your body, your energy is locked down to your first three creative centers, the first, the second, and the third. Now, when that happens, then all the energy that you've had in your electromagnetic field, if we were to measure this with, with a special device, we would see that the electromagnetic field would automatically collapse because that energy is pulled in to the first three energy centers 
And what happens is your body physically becomes denser. It becomes heavier. That's why you will, you will actually hear people say, I'm sure you've heard people say, it's like, oh, they, I feel like I have the weight of the world on my shoulders. That's because that electromagnetic field has collapsed. People who are in chronic depression or even temporary depression, when you are in that kind of state of being, your electromagnetic field, make no mistakes, you've pulled energy from your electromagnetic field and you've collapsed it. Your very dense matter, you're very heavy, you're very weighted down. Sometimes you will actually feel when somebody walks into the room that you're in and you feel sometimes with and so, you know, everything is light and airy and everybody's up and joyful. And then you have somebody that walks in with or without a scowl makes no difference, but you feel that their energy is very heavy. And then all of a sudden you kind of feel like the light is being sucked out of the room or all of a sudden you kind of start to feel like something's pulling on your energy. And that's that individual. And then there are things that you can do to protect your energy so that when people are uh, in that state, it doesn't affect you. You can literally zip yourself up so that you are unaffected by that and that your electromagnetic field continues to be untainted, if you will. So when stress is thrown into the equation, our body begins to draw from the invisible electromagnetic field of energy around us to produce chemistry. The greater the frequency, intensity, and duration of the stress, the more energy our body consumes. The very nature of these chemicals endorses our senses, causing us to pay attention to matter and knowns. So again, pause here. It's making us pay attention. It's a, new, it's a Newtonian physics world paradigm. Your view and your MO is to look, you're trying to predict um, outcomes. And based on your experience of the past, you're using your experience of the past to predict what is going to happen in the future because your fear is not wanting any surprises. Because your perception is, that surprises are in fact a negative thing where, where in reality, if you were to be in a different place of being, you would recognize that those surprises are oftentimes um, have wonderful benefits and wonderful things that the universe is trying to, to bring to you. But because you are in a fear-based mode, you're always preparing for an emergency. You're, uh, you know, you're always um, expecting for another shoe to drop. You're preparing for a rainy day. Uh, you know, it's always expecting a negative outcome as opposed to being open for unexpected, wonderful possibilities. Now, I'm not suggesting by any way, shape, or form that you should not prepare yourself. You know, have proper insurance, have you know, backup supplies and things like that. That's not what I'm saying. That's definitely not what Dr. Joe is saying. But to operate from moment to moment on a day-to-day -day basis from the perspective that you're always waiting for another shoe to drop or something bad to happen, that is going to create more negative bad outcomes for you. For you, If you're expecting, if you're always, you know, trying to fend off illness, guess what? You're going to create illness because your focus is on illness, not on health and well-being. As this vital field of energy around our body shrinks, we feel more like matter and less like energy. In fact, when our frequency slows down, our bodies become more dense as we run out of energy. And as we have discussed, this is fine for a short term, you know, when there's danger present, when there's crisis or a predator is lurking around the corner, in fact, the fight or flight response has been the cornerstone of our evolution. In this state, stress chemicals heighten our senses, narrowing our focus to whatever matter in our environment represents potential danger. So when this happens, our neocortex, the part of the brain involved in sensory perception, motor commands, spatial reasoning, and language fires and becomes aroused. So for survival purposes, this narrows our focus on our body and the external threat, causing us to become preoccupied by the time between the moment of the perceived threat and the moment we reach physical safety, both of which are points of consciousness. The more we experience stress, the more we feel separation. So it's no wonder we feel heavier, denser, 
we're in, when we're in that place because our electromagnetic field, again, can't repeat this enough, our electromagnetic field has dropped, it literally collapses, and now all that energy is tied to your first, second, third energy centers, and then you kind of can't look, you can't really look much past your nose because you are looking for any tiny little thing, and that's gonna create you to react, and in many cases, even overreact. And sometimes that's why you will see people who are, it's like, oh, you would, they behave as if they have wounds all over their body because the tiniest little thing that you tell them incites a reaction out of them. And that's because they are in their pain bodies and they have blockages, obviously in the first, second and third energy centers and they're not connected to their heart. They definitely can't speak their truth their pineal gland, forget it, it's, things are out of whack. But the good news is that you yourself, you don't have to go anywhere to fix this. That's what this book is about. You being empowered to use these tools, to apply them to yourself so that you can create a magnificent life, create health and well-being, and so on and so forth. So as you read in chapter two, the long-term effect of living in survival mode is that we begin to thrive. You're thriving now and becoming addicted to these stress chemicals. So I'm going to stop right here because how many of you have known people who everything is fine. You're like happy and cheery and everything. And then all of a sudden they call you on the phone and they're picking a fight with you. And even when you agree with them, they're still trying to pick a fight with you. That is clearly evidence of someone who is addicted to the hormones of stress. It's someone who, in their own ignorance, they don't even realize the self-sabotage and the self-misery that they're not only creating in their lives, but they're also trying to suck you into their drama, their train of pain, because their addiction to that stress is so great that they're gonna probably get the person that's closest to them, girlfriend or boyfriend, depending on who it is, who's the instigator, who's picking up the phone and then starting to pick some sort of a fight. It could be between a parent and child, child or parent, and go either way. It could be with a coworker that you work closely with. There's no limit to who this, can, this interaction can take place, but I'm sure you've all experienced this. And that's really what's going on. That person who is that instigator, they are showing you the level of pain that they're having and the, the gravity of the addiction that they have to the hormones of stress. Make no mistakes, there are people who are addicted to having a dark night of the soul, that are addicted to having depression. They are addicted to being in the woe is me, to always being in that state. They don't have to be in that state, but until they don't realize this, and perhaps it's you, perhaps it's somebody that you know, the bottom line is that this work is here to show you a way out if you choose to use your free will to relieve yourself of that pain. That's the good news. So as you read in chapter two, the long-term effect of living in survival mode is that we begin to thrive on and become addicted to these stress chemicals. And the more addicted we are to them, the more we believe we are our bodies that are local in this space and time, occupying a particular position in linear time. And the result is a manic, frenetic state where we continuously shift our attention from one person to one problem, to one thing, to one place in our environment. So the evolutionary trait that once protected us now works against us and we live on constant high alert, obsessing about time. And because we view our external environment as unsafe, all of our attention is on our environment. I'm going to pause here again. We have the reticulator activating system, the RAS, and that is located in your brain. And what the reticular activating system does is it, scan, it constantly scans, scanning your environment and, ex, and scanning your experience in your world for things that are familiar or whatever it is that you're giving your attention and focus to. 
So if you are looking for, you know, our politicians to do something that will offend you or that is bad, or if you, were, if you just bought a car, a red Honda, as an example, if you just bought a red Honda, once you bought that red Honda, now you're gonna start to notice on the road, all the other red Hondas, which they did, you only noticed white, gray, and black cars and blue cars before, but now that you bought your red Honda, you notice, oh my gosh, where did all these red Hondas come from? I thought I was being so unique picking this red Honda. Now everywhere I turn, not only do I see red Hondas, but I even see red Isuzus and red, um, I don't know, red Beamers that look like red Hondas uh, to me. And I never noticed how similar these three cars, they look like the exact same car, three different makers. It's because your RAS is scanning for that. So whatever it is you're looking for, you're gonna find it. I just heard earlier today, Aaron Doherty and Brian Scott was talking, they were talking on a, on, um, on YouTube and I believe Brian Scott was interviewing Aaron and they were both debaters uh, when they were in high school and, and in college. And one of the things that they talked about that they learned in the debates, which this all ties to the RAS, is that they had to argue on two opposing viewpoints. Sometimes it was pro, it was for or against a particular argument. And sometimes they were aligned with what they were arguing with, but oftentimes they were required to debate the opposing side. And as they looked for evidence to support whichever side they were on, they always found supporting evidence. And what they said was that it opened their minds to realize that, oh, I could see how this is true in this case, the for, and I can see how this is true in the case against. And so really where does the truth lie? Because if you are always looking for the negative, you're gonna find it. If you're always looking for the positive, you're going to find it. Again, where attention goes, energy goes. So I'm just bringing that to your attention because the RAS, your reticular aid activating system, is there to help you find whatever it is that you're looking for. So as our outer world now appears more real than our inner world, we're addicted to someone or something in our external environment. And the longer we live in this state, the more our brains move into high, high beta brain waves. And as you know by now, prolonged high beta brain waves cause us to feel pain, anxiety, worry, fear, anger, frustration, judgment, impatience, aggression, and competition. So as a result, our brain waves become incoherent. And so do we. So I'm going to stop here for a moment because yes, that high beta, uh, that high beta brainwave state causes competition. All competition truly is, is a state of separation. One of the things that I learned when I was running my mortgage company, I had a mortgage bank that I started off as a little mortgage brokerage in a one bedroom apartment when I first got married and then grew that was, um, it, it became very clear to me that I had no competition, that size didn't matter. You know, I wasn't competing against Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase Bank, Countrywide uh, Home Loans, any, any other uh, lender or loan officer that was out there. It, it became really irrelevant. If anything, I was only competing against myself and because I knew my, I had a certain skill set and I had a certain craft, I could guarantee certain timelines and a, the delivery of certain things that people all of a sudden, my client base never shopped me for price, the, the interest rate or the cost on the loan. The things that I would hear uh, my colleagues talk about who, who worked from, for other companies because I was self-employed. Um, oh, you know, they lost this deal. They lost this client because, you know, somebody offered them a lower interest rate or they could do it for less fees or what have you. I never had those issues. But in my mind, I really didn't believe that I had competition. I was just a small little mortgage brokerage. I was doing my own thing, making sure that I took care. I was staying in my own lane, taking care of my clients to the best of my abilities, always perfecting and improving so that I could offer and deliver everything that I, you know, I would tell people what I was gonna do, I did it, and then I 
I did it and then I would tell them what I had done and when they saw the consistency they're like wow and so people would then come to me my turned out that my clients were my best sales force it wasn't just me out there promoting myself and selling myself they became my best sales force and therefore that's why I, I didn't have competition even through the recession you know we had the recession of the 90s and then we had the recession of 2008 and that really didn't come into play. So I just want to bring that to your attention because competition, when you're buying, there's a healthy type of competition where you're, you know, the competition, um, it's like iron, as iron sharpens iron, so is one man to the other. That is to say, when you are competing in a healthy manner, your book, the two parties are making each other better because both of you have to rise to the occasion as opposed to a cutthroat competition where you have to put down or one has to lose in order for somebody else to win. Does that make sense? When the emotions of survival have a hold on us, we need the conditions in our external world, our problems with different people, financial hardships, fear or fear of terrorism, disdain of our job, to reaffirm our addiction to those emotions. So these emotional addictions cause us to become preoccupied by whatever we think might be causing the upset in our environment, whether it be someone or something. And as a result, the survival gene switches on. So now we're living in a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you understand that where you place your attention is where you place your energy, you know that the stronger the emotional reaction associated with the cause, the more you will consistently place all your attention on a person, thing, or problem in your external world. So when you do this, you're giving quite a bit of your power away to someone or something. Now, all your attention and energy is anchored in this three-dimensional realm of the material and your emotional state is causing you to continuously reaffirm your present reality. So you can become emotionally attached to this reality. You really want to change. This mismanagement of your energy keeps you enslaved to the world of the knowns, trying to predict the future based on the past. What's more, when you're in that survival state, the unknown or the predictable is a scary place. So for you to truly make changes in your life, you would have to step into the unknown. And if you don't, nothing ever really changes. I want to bring to your attention, this is something actually I was on a video conference call earlier uh, this afternoon with three other businesswomen and healers from uh, different parts of the country. And one of the things that uh, we were talking about is, and I pointed out to one of them that, you know, we're talking women who uh, right now they're very accomplished and, you know, you, you, it's taken their lifetime, you know, to get to this point of success, affluence, abundance, prosperity, health and well-being. But, you know, one was a high school dropout. Another one, you know, at one point became homeless. Um, you know, there's all these different uh, trials and tribulations that they had to go through. But one thing was very distinct. Their mindset wasn't that they were trying to survive despite the adversities that they were facing. They were mindful about wanting to thrive. And so my message to you is if you find, pay close attention because if you notice that you are saying in your languaging, in your talking, because there is power in words, there is a vibrational frequency. And when you think survival and you're speaking survival, that's creating a feedback loop that's going to keep you on just barely surviving. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to just barely, barely make it. You don't want to just barely survive. You want to thrive. You want to grow. You want to be uh, in a place of, uh, of abundance, not a, a place where you're 
barely gonna make it over the hump because that's just going to create more of that. So you want to be able to thrive. You want to, to grow. You want to, th to be in a place of expansion, not just of, of barely making it and then contraction. The Newtonian 3D space-time reality, living as a somebody with something somewhere in some time. So if feelings and emotions are a record of the past, and those feelings are driving your hardwired thoughts and behaviors, you'll keep repeating your past and therefore become predictable and boring. That's my little sidebar. So now you're firmly ensconced in the Newtonian world because Newtonian physics is based on predictable outcomes. The more you live in stress, the more you are simply matter trying to affect matter to matter, trying to fight, force, manipulate, predict, control, and compete for outcomes. So as a result, everything you want to change, you want to manifest or influence is going to take a lot of time because in this space-time reality, you have to move your physical body through space to create the outcomes you want. So the more you are living in survival and using your senses to define reality, the more you experience separation from a new future between where you are presently as one of the points of consciousness and where you want to be as another point of consciousness lies a very long distance, not to mention that your constant obsession on how it's going to happen is based on how you think and predict it should happen. But if you're predicting, your thinking is based on knowns. So there's no room for an unknown or new possibility in your life. A pleasant surprise. So if you're trying to buy a house, for example, you need to save for a down payment look for a house, get a loan, go through the application process, beat out other buyers, and then spend 30 years dragging your body back and forth through space, trying to pay it off. These two points of consciousness, having the idea to buy a house and having the house with the mortgage paid off are gonna take time to intersect. In a similar way, if you want a new relationship, you might go online, set up a profile, scroll through countless other profiles, make a list of people to reach out to, contact each one, and eventually go on many dates in the hopes of finding someone intriguing. If you want a new job, you might take the time to create a resume, search for open positions, and go on interviews. What these processes have in common is they require time which you have experienced is linear in 3D reality. So you may get what you want, but the more you live in survival, the more time it's going to take because your matter trying to influence matter. And there is a distinct separation in space and time between where you are and where you wanna be. So we can agree then that in this three-dimensional reality, within your experience of time, there's a definite past, present, and future. So since you live in a linear time, you also experience a separation from time because the past, present, and future appear as separate moments in time. You are here and your future is there. Figure 11.2 graphically represents how the past, present, and future all exist as distinct discontinuous moments. In our 3D reality, the past, the present, and the future exist as linear, distinct, separate moments in time. And as I said earlier, thanks to Newtonian physics, we've unraveled the natural laws of force, acceleration, and matter, allowing us to predict outcomes. I'm gonna pause right here. In fact, that's what physicists do all the time. They have formulas where that be based on Newtonian physics.
and the assumption of things having to do with force acceleration and matter that equals a certain result. And that is an effort to predict certain outcomes based on certain assumed knowns. That's also on the assumption that those knowns won't change. But as we know, things can change in 5D once we connect to the energy waveforms and give it attention, then we can transmute that energy. We can actually morph it. It's like us putting our hands on the clay and shaping it into whatever it is that we want. So if we know the general direction, the velocity and rotation of an object traveling through space, for the most part, we can actually predict where it's going to end up and how long it will take. This is why we can travel from New York to LA by plane, predict how long it's going to take to get there and know where the plane will land. Within the understanding of Newtonian physics and this three-dimensional world we live in, many of us spend most of our lives focusing our attention outward on trying to become a someone, have somebody, own some things, go somewhere and experience something in some time. So when we don't have the things we want, we experience lack. And lack and separation cause us to live in a state of duality and polarity. So it's natural for us to want what we don't have. In fact, this is how we create things. When we experience separation from our future desires, we think and dream of what we want and then set about performing a series of actions in linear time to get to them. So if we're always under financial stress, for example, we want money. If we have a disease, we want health. If we feel lonely, we want a relationship or companionship. Because of this experience of duality and separation, we are driven to create. And this is how we naturally evolve and grow towards our dreams. But if we are matter, focused on matter, trying to influence matter to get money, health, love, and so on, as we've established, it's gonna take quite a bit of time and energy. When we finally attain what we are seeking, the emotion we feel from the fruition of our creation or the meeting of those two points of consciousness satiates the sense of lack we formerly experienced. So when the new job comes, we feel secure. And when the new relationship manifests, we feel love and joy. As we heal, we feel more whole. We, if we are living in this state, we are waiting for something or someone outside of us to change how we feel internally. Once we feel relief from that experience of lack, because we are embracing that emotion correlated with the manifestation of the external event, we pay close attention to whomever or whatever caused the relief. Again, pay attention to the exterior focus under the illusion that that's creating relief. This cause and effect forms a new memory and to some degree, we evolve. Okay, I'm gonna pause right here because in this last section that we're, we're reading right now, what he is describing, he doesn't call it being um, incomplete, but in essence, that's really what happens. When you are looking for someone, something, somewhere, in some time to fulfill you, to make you feel whole, to make you feel at peace, to make you feel whole on the inside, then you're giving your power away to that person, place, or thing, whatever it is, because you're not whole on the inside, so you are giving your power away, as he mentioned in this last section here. So again, if we're living in this state, we are waiting for something or someone outside of us to change how we feel internally. The key is to change ourselves internally so you feel happy, you feel love, you feel gratitude, appreciation, you feel complete, but you genuinely feel it from the inside unconditionally without having the externals, without having to have COVID gone, without having to have the quarantine lifted, without having to have, I think you get the drift, without having to, to be living in a different place. You are already in that state of being 
feeling whole where you don't lack anything any longer. And everyone, oh, I'm gonna say everyone, with few exceptions, people think that, oh, yeah, it's easy for you to feel like that because look at you, you're all fine and dandy now. But the reality is we all, one thing is true. We all have to go through the road, uh, you know, Robert Frost calls it the road less traveled. You all have to go down that road where you recognize you have to have mastery of self. You have to do the work of self mastery. You have to recognize who your true self is and the voice of ego, the voice of your brain, the voice of your mind, and recognize that your thoughts, feelings, and emotions are not in fact you. The true you is the loving you. It's the love that you have inside you. And the true loving you doesn't doubt you, doesn't second guess, doesn't put you down, doesn't think that you're not enough, doesn't think that you're less than. Not only that, it does not think that about yourself and it does not think that about others because in recognition of that, that state of pure love, you also off, offer compassion and you know that others have that, but they're still, they're in that duality state where they're still fighting with all that, that lack, which creates a separation within you. And by it creating a separation within you, it's also creating a separation on the outside. So you're still giving your energy away to someone, somebody, something, someplace, somewhere in some time. And that's what this work is. It's trying to show you it's like Dorothy when she clicked her heels. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. Home is inside. It's never, it's never gone anywhere. It's been drowned by the loud voice of ego and your brain and your mind, but it's always been here. And so this is the journey back to self. You know, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, to thine own self be true. And it's coming to the true you who you truly are. So when the new job comes, we feel secure. When the new relationship manifests, we feel love and joy. As we heal, we feel more whole. If we are living in the state, we are waiting for something or someone outside of us to change how we feel internally. And once we feel relief from that experience of lack, being unwhole, because we are embracing the emotion correlated with a manifestation of the external event, we pay close attention to whomever or whatever caused the relief there are savior we may not think that that there are savior but that's what we're feeling it's like oh what a relief this cause and effect forms a new memory and to some degree we evolve so when something in our world doesn't happen or seems to be taking a long time to happen we experience more lack because we feel more separate from what we're trying to create. Now, our own emotional state of lack, frustration, impatience, and separation is keeping our dreams at a distance, further increasing the time it will take for our desired outcome to occur. From somebody to nobody, from someone to no one, from something to no thing, from somewhere to nowhere, and from some time to no time. So if Newtonian laws are an outward expression of the physical material laws of space and time, a dimension where there's more space and time, we could say in a sense that quantum laws are the inverse. So the quantum is an inward expression of the laws of nature an invisible field of information and energy that unifies everything material. This immaterial field organizes, connects, and governs all the laws of nature. It is a dimension where there's more time than space. In other words, it's a dimension where time is eternal. As you learned in chapters two and three, when we take our attention off people and things at certain places in our external world, no longer placing our attention on our body and ceasing to think about time and schedules, 
we become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, in no time. We do this through a process of disconnecting from our body and our identity, our gender, our disease, our name, our problems, our personal relationships, our pain, our past, and so on. This is what it means to get beyond self, to go from the consciousness of somebody to nobody, from the consciousness of someone to no one, from consciousness of something to no thing, from consciousness of somewhere to nowhere, and from consciousness of being in some time to being in no time. So see figure 11.3. So when we take our attention off our body, our environment, our time, we get beyond the self, living as a physical body, being somebody as an identity, owning some things, living in some place at some time. And we become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere and no time. Now we are moving our consciousness and awareness away from the material world of Newtonian physics and towards the immaterial world of the unified field. Sorry. <laughs> and take a glance at 11.4. This distinction between the two worlds of matter and energy, as we move from a narrow focus to an open focus and begin to surrender all aspects of self, we move away from the external world of people, things, places, schedules, to-do lists, and so on and so on, and turn our attention to the inner world of energy, vibration, and frequency, and consciousness. Our research shows that when we take our attention off of objects and matter and instead open our focus to energy and information, different parts of the brain actually work together in harmony. The result of this unification of the brain is that we feel more whole. And when we do this properly, our heart begins to open beat more rhythmically and thus become more coherent. So as the heart moves into coherence, so too does our brain. And because our identity is out of the way, meaning we have gotten beyond our body, a particular place in our known environment and time, the act of eliminating those things causes us to move to an alpha and theta brainwave pattern and we connect with the autonomic nervous system, our ANS. As the ANS becomes activated, its job is to restore order, balance, and causing coherence and wholeness in our heart and our brain and our body, as well as our energy field, our electromagnetic frequency and our electromagnetic field also known as the torus or the toroidal field. This coherence is then reflected in all aspects of our biology. So it is in this state where we begin to connect to the quantum or unified field. So from the illusion of separation to the reality of oneness. So if Newtonian physics explains the physical laws of nature, and the universe on a grand scale, the gravitational force of the sun upon the planets, the speed with which the apple falls from the tree, and so on and so on. The quantum world deals with the fundamental nature of things at their smallest scale, such as atomic and subatomic particles. Newtonian laws are physical constants of nature, so the Newtonian world is an objective world of measurable or measurability, and predictable outcomes. So in quantum laws, however, we deal with the unpredictable and the unseen world of energy waves and frequency, information consciousness, and all spectrums of light. So governing this world is an unseen constant, a single field of information called the unified field. I'm gonna pause right here. I believe Max Planck called it the zero, the zero quantum field. You may have heard of that. So we can think of Newtonian world as dealing with the objective where mind and matter are separate and of the quantum world as dealing with subjective where mind 
and matter are unified by energy or better yet where mind and matter are so connected that it's impossible to separate the two in the quantum or unified field there's no separation between the two points of consciousness it is the domain of oneness or unity and consciousness i'm going to pause right here because i'm brought right now something that's brought to mind and i kind of feel like spirits wanting me to share this with you is um, i'm sure a lot of you have seen on tv and movies yada yada maybe even in person you've seen somebody take a one inch wood plaque and have actually put their hand through it through either a karate chop or a striking of that board which under normal circumstances you go to hit that board and that board is you know it's solid and so you go to hit it and you could be a massive football player that's 250 300 pounds and you might try to put your um you know break that board and you, there isn't you know you don't have the strength to do it even as big and mighty as you might be at 300 pounds and maybe a nfl football player and you won't be able to put your hand through and then you turn around and then you see this 12 year old kid in his karate class that same exact wood because they got 30 40 of them and they had everybody in class you know they give them the instructions and they're told how to how to strike it and then you see this 12 year old in comparison to this 25 year old 300 pound you know football player and the 12 year old did it and the 300 pound nfl football player didn't do it and that has to do with quantum physics it has to do with this work that you're learning as you're reading studying and applying becoming supernatural because what happens is and i'm going to tell you this from personal experience because i have more than once you know, as petite as I am, I don't have a lot of power in terms of physical strength. Uh, you know, I can't pick up 200 pounds. You know, maybe uh, in an extraordinary circumstance, if I had to for the protection of my child, perhaps I probably, I probably could. But typically, you know, I barely weigh 100 pounds. So the point being is that as you look at a one inch thick piece of wood, when I was given instructions on how to do this, and this was the, the, uh, the guide, the teacher, the instructor that I had, great manifester, with only an eighth grade education, a formal education, but he has a ton, he's got a PhD in all the self-educating, and it's Alex Sinek. You can look him up online, he's one of my Facebook friends, but and he, he gives fantastic, powerful seminars, and one of the things that he taught us to do was, you know, he had, we, there was probably about 120 of us or 150 of us, and he had these boards and we were supposed to write what we, whatever our concern or fear was, right? And, and then we were supposed to break it. And he gave us a very specific instruction as to, you know, what to do. And basically what he was doing was having us focus on the 5D world and showing us how we could, if we followed his instruction exactly and we didn't hold ourselves back because Interestingly enough, as we witnessed people going up, you could see people right before they were gonna hit the board, they didn't believe that they could do it. And you could see them physically holding back. And of course, when they, you know, you're supposed to put your hand all the way through. And of course they didn't put their hand all the way through because every, you know, they would hold back. You could physically see somebody holding back. And then of course they would fail, you know, and they would just red up their hand and so forth. And so the bottom line is that if you look at a one, one inch piece of wood, there are, there's a grain of wood that travels in either direction, depending on how it's being held. But in the direction that that grain is, you know, um, organized, there's obviously space in between the, um, the direction that the wood is growing. So if the lines, let's say the lines are going up and down, then there's obviously space in between the lines as you look at the grain of wood there's space in between so you could see it's like okay i could see if i put my hand through it's going to break this way as opposed to if the lines were going this way and i put my hand through it then it's going to break you know it'll break this way so as you become aware of that and as you follow the instruction you position yourself and you strike it and you visualize yourself putting your hand through the board 
and you do it in one continuous motion and you don't just stop at the point of impact but your hand travels through and you visualize yourself putting your hand all the way through the board then lo and behold even somebody as small as me or a 12 year old can actually put their hand through that board and it follows all the way through but basically that's all it is and that is using the 5d reality because you're aware of the vulnerability of the wood you're recognizing that that wood although it appears our natural eyes are interpreting it as being solid but my inner knowing recognizes is aware is comprehending understanding realizing that there is space inside that wood that space creates the vulnerability in the wood so i can have a breakthrough i want you to see the application of this in your life because there are things that appear to be solid perhaps it's your illness perhaps it's a relationship that's not going well perhaps it's what's going on with um, the negative things that we might perceive that our government is doing the self-imposed not self-imposed, the imposed things that are put upon us. They appear to be, they appear to be rock solid, but they're not. There are spaces in between. Like I said earlier in this broadcast, we know from quantum physicists that everything, I don't care if it's a mouse, I don't care if it's this stick, if it's this, this meditation bowl, as solid as it may appear to be, it's not solid. It appears to be solid from your natural 3D perspective, but it's not solid. It's 99.9% .9 space. It has a vulnerability of space. And that space is what gives me the opportunity to go in there and in 5D, once I get into heart and to brain coherence, if I wanted to, I could probably bend this. That's how people bend spoons. My best friend and I, we actually been playing with quantum physics for a long time and these spiritual precepts but yes you can actually bend a spoon with your mind because of the space in the molecules that are in the spoon and you become one with the spoon and then you actually see the spoon it will actually bend you can do all sorts of things this 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 is why you really are becoming supernatural which is actually your true nature this is who you've always been the separation has come from the ego, from the brain, recording the past feelings, thoughts, and emotions into your body, and then your addiction to that, your personal reality becomes your personality by default, not by design. That's what Tony Robbins is trying to, to do is by showing you how to master your emotional states so that you can take ownership of that. And then on purpose, with consciousness decide to be who it is you truly want to be and embrace the true you and so dr joe dispenza is just a different approach so i hope this all makes sense to you please write comments uh, below let me know if anything is not clear if you need a further um, ref, you know refinement redefinition relanguaging i want to say i want to i recognize that i'm i'm fairly good I've been told to creating word pictures and, and and my goal is to really not just give you a gun without bullets in it I want to give you a gun that has bullets so that you can hit the bullseye okay whereas in our three-dimensional reality space is infinite in quantum world time is infinite if time is infinite and eternal it's no longer linear meaning there is no separation from the past and of the future so with no past or future everything is happening right now in this eternal present moment because time is infinite in time space reality as we move through time we experience space or spaces pause button again so what you need to know that in 5d when we take our attention and we're going now into this realm and we are in the recognition we are no one, nobody, no thing, nowhere, no place, in no time. And we, you actually don't feel your body now in meditation because you are focused with your breath. Your goal is to slow down your heart rate, slow down your breath, slow down your brain waves. Time is fluid in that dimension. 
It is not linear. And that is why, if you've ever wondered, it's like, wow, how did Oprah go from being, you know, a poor black child who was, you know, abused, who had nothing, who her home, they had an outhouse, that her grandmother was a housekeeper. How did she go from that to being a billionaire? And then there are other people who work their assets off their entire life and never break a hundred grand. She understands that time is not linear. She understands these concepts of becoming supernatural. That is how she built her entire career as she learned, as she learned them, acquired them and revealed them to the public. That's what has led and she put her intention. She talks about one of the most powerful things she has her is her intention. And she always asks her staff and her producers, it's like, you know, where is our intention? We have to be very mindful of our intention because when you are doing this work, time is fluid. And that's when all of a sudden things that would normally take you years, decades to accomplish. Now, all of a sudden you collapse the time continuum because everything is fluid in the, in the 5d. And now all of a sudden things happen instantly and you're like oh my gosh and then you have the coincidences you have you start to attract the people places and things in order to accomplish whatever it is it really is like this great conspiracy conspiracy from i, I want to expand and say not just from the universe but from multi-dimensional places of being that conspire to coalesce and make sure that what you have intended and what you are putting together comes to pass time is fluid the past the present and the future all exist in the now the the multi-dimensional um, aspects of you there are many different versions of you that exist in this plane as you do these meditations some of those dimensions are revealed to you and so they are living and you know the better um, a better, more improved version of you exists in a different dimension of reality. It's living, that's your life that's being lived in a different dimension, in a different universe. And it's happening right now. So if you want things to improve, you can tap into that different dimension of you and you can embody that so that you can move forward in this plane of existence, embracing that aspect of you. So now you kick to the curb that aspect of you that is less desirable and you embody and own that version of you. In the world of space time, as we increase or decrease the speed with which we go from point, point A to point B, the time it takes to get there changes. So in the world of time space, as we become aware of an increase or decrease in the speed of the frequency or the vibration of energy, we can go from one space to another space or from one dimension to another dimension. When we collapse space, we experience time in the material reality. And when we collapse time, we experience spaces or dimensions in the immaterial world. Each of those individual frequencies is carrying information or a level of consciousness that we experience as different realities. And as we become aware of them in figure 11.5, you can see that as you move through time, you experience different dimensions in the eternal present moment. I'm gonna pause here again. I, I think I mentioned before in one of the previous chapters, I had a really profound mystical experience where I wasn't aspiring or looking or intending to experience different dimensions of reality. To be honest with you, the different dimensions wasn't really on my radar. My intention was to open up my heart as great as possible with the most amount, more love than I had ever experienced before is what I had intended and to broadcast it out to the world because my intention was to heal all beings, all things on the planet and expanding out. And I know, I know that as I do that, that other beings, that vibrational frequency then entrains to all the others who are in that love vibrational frequency. And it's all to, to make everyone feel better, feel love, become whole, 
and to find their place back to their true north, to, them, to their true selves. So if they have any kind of disease, that it will dissolve that and so on and so forth. But in that meditative um, state, I actually experienced multiple dimensions of reality, which I mean, you can only imagine how surprised I must have been because I wasn't seeking that, it just happened. And I had a biological upgrade that was applied to me while I was, uh, I found out in the sixth dimension. I even opened a door. If you, at the end of the, uh, I know the last several chapters, I've put that video. So if any of you want to check it out, I explain what I saw. But one of the things that I saw as I moved from one dimension to the other was that I opened a door. And as I opened the door, it was like, almost like opening, you know how, I'm going to take this pad of paper to kind of give you, see how when you go like this, so it's kind of like I was opening the door this way. And instead of just opening the one door, I opened the door and then all these different dimensions. I didn't know they were dimensions. I was told that they were dimensions. I just opened the door and I'm like, what the heck? And then I was told those are the different dimensions of reality. And I said, whoa. And so they told me to continue into the sixth dimension. And I thought, sixth dimension? I'm like, okay. So I won't get into the details here. You can go watch that video afterwards. But that is just to let you know, here we just talked about the different dimensions in the eternal present moment. And that's alluding to the different planes of reality that exist simultaneously. On planet Earth, we measure time based on the rotations the rotations that our planet does going around the sun 365 days a year to do a full rotation, but also as the earth spins on its axis, time is measured. You know, the revolution of the globe, one full revolution is 24 hours. But think about it, if you're not on planet earth and you're just floating in space, do 24 hours, is time measured the same? The only reason why it's measured in 24 hours is because somebody said, oh, we noticed that it takes 24 hours to go from sunrise to sunrise. So we all agreed that's a day. You go the cycle of daytime and nighttime and back to day. That took 24 hours. Okay, so we're gonna call, we're gonna divide that into 24 hours. Each hour is 60 minutes, yada, yada, yada. You follow the train of thought. If you were not born on earth and let's say, let's fast forward and let's say it's 300 years from now and now we, travel through space and time and we are in outer space. Let's say a kid is born on a spaceship, not on planet Earth. I don't know if we would still keep to the 24 hour model because off the planet, if you're not rotating around the sun and you're not rotating on your axis, you see what I mean? So time is a concept and a paradigm that is inherent to Earth. On those other dimensional planes, it doesn't really exist. And, it, and on these other planes of reality, these other dimension, it's the same. So it all of them exist all in the now. Okay, so in the world of quantum where time is eternal, everything is happening in the eternal present moment. And as you move through time, you experience other spaces, other dimensions, other planes, other realities, and infinite possibilities. So like standing between two mirrors, and looking both ways at yourself into infinite dimensions, the boxes represent an infinite number of possible views, all living in the present moment. Now I'll stop here again. Recognize, I'll never forget, um, I had a conversation with my son. Um, I think at the time he must have been like eight or nine years old. And and we were talking about whatever, I don't really discuss what I I don't remember specifically what we were discussing, but I do remember telling him, make no mistakes. Things can, can get infinitely worse or infinitely better. The choice is yours. Do you want it to get infinitely worse or do you want it to get infinitely better? Where you choose to focus your attention on, if you focus on how things are getting better and better and better, they will get better and better. If you focus on how things are getting worse and worse and worse, then you're going to go down the toilet. You know, it's like, you know, going down a, the vortex, the rabbit hole of, oh, woe is me. And things are just going to get worse and worse and worse. And it's infinite. Just when you thought things could get worse or get better, they do. 
and only you have the power to focus where your free will, your focus, your attention is going to go. You, you take that awareness, that consciousness, and you're the one who's the captain of your ship, nobody else. You have no one to blame. No one is coercing you to focus on this, that, or whatnot. That's your response ability, your ability to respond to who you are and what you want. That's, that's you, you can't blame anybody else. Okay, so in space time, you experience the environment with your body and with your senses and time. Time appears linear because you separate from objects, things, people and places, as well as the past and the future. In the time space, however, you experience this realm with your awareness as a consciousness, not as a body with senses. This realm exists beyond your senses. So you access this domain when you are totally in the present moment. So there is no past, no past, no future, just one long now. Since your awareness is beyond the realm of matter, because you have taken all your attention off of matter, you can become aware of different frequencies carrying information. And these frequencies allow you to have access to different unknown dimensions. So if you are in a realm above the senses in 5D and unfolding as consciousness into the energy of the unified field, you can experience many possible dimensional realities. I know that this is a big bite to take in all at once. So hang in there. If you are confused, it means you're about to learn something new. So when I say that as you move through time, you experience space or spaces, I mean all possible dimensions and possible realities. We could say then that in this time-space reality, all possible spaces or dimensions exist in infinite time. This is the unified field, the realm of possibilities unknowns and new potential realities all of which exist in endless time which is every time so let's think of it another way everybody i know is always saying that they want or need more time to get more things accomplished if you had more time you could create more experiences do more things and therefore get more things done this would mean more possibilities could happen and you could live more of life so now imagine that there was an infinite amount of time because the past and the future no longer exist. So time is standing still and you had all the time you needed. Wouldn't you agree that you could have endless possible experiences and therefore could live many lives? We could say then that an infinite number of experiences would be available to you equal to your imagination. To say it yet another way, if time is eternal, then more spaces can exist in that infinite time. If we keep elongating or making more time, it makes sense that we can fit more spaces into time. If there is infinite time, then there are infinite spaces we can fit in time, which are endless possibilities, potential realities, dimensions, and experiences. So in the quantum field, there's no separation of past or future because everything that is exists in the eternal now or the eternal present moment. If everything that is exists unified or connected in the quantum field, then it's infinite frequencies contain information about everybody, everyone, everything, everywhere, and every time. As your consciousness begins to merge with the consciousness and energy of the unified field, you will go from the consciousness of somebody to the consciousness of nobody, to the consciousness of everybody, from the consciousness of someone to consciousness of no one, to the consciousness of 
everyone from the consciousness of something to the consciousness of no thing to the consciousness of everything from the consciousness of somewhere to the consciousness of nowhere to the consciousness of everywhere and from the consciousness of being in some time to the consciousness of being in no time to the consciousness of being in every time so take a look at figure 11.6 so i want to pause here again and one of the things I that came to me during meditation during my first day at the monastery in Cancun last year was I, I heard it was a like a vibrational frequency interpretation of words that gave me the knowingness that I am one with the one I am the one and I and it immediately grabbed my attention as soon as I became aware of it and I thought oh and, and it, it kept on repeating itself and then I embraced it and then I start it became my mantra which it's never stopped since then I'm one with the one and I think that there's a key here to that I know that that's describing what this is he didn't language it that way but I'm that's why I'm sharing it with you because I feel inspired and I'm prompted to share it with you so as I became aware of that and I heard it, I heard it some, I don't remember how many times I heard it, but I did hear it a few times. And then I recognized it and I, it's almost like a remembrance. And then I started, I didn't think about it. I just started repeating it. So it wasn't like a thought where I'm like, oh, I'm gonna repeat that. No, I just started saying it over and over again. And then and it's just something that I instinctively have been repeating every time, all the time, every day whether I'm in meditation or whether I'm in my regular conscious state, I am always saying I'm one with the one, I am the one. And I have a joyful, gleeful feeling about it. Uh, every time I say that, there's something about the vibrational frequency of that saying that just does something to connect me to the unified field in a way that I really can't describe with words. So I'm one with the one, I am the one. I kind of sense that there that's part of not just connecting one with the one and having you acknowledge, accept, surrender, and believe the fact that you are one with the one and that you are really the one, but it also has an inherent feeling of um, gratitude. Gratitude and peace is probably the best way I can describe it. I'm going to leave it at that because that's a rabbit hole that runs deep. So. Okay, as your consciousness merges with the consciousness of the unified field and you unfold deeper into it, you become the consciousness of everybody, everyone, everything, everywhere, in every time. And in this realm, there is no separation between two points of consciousness, which means there is only oneness. I'm one with the one, I am the one. I hope this makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense, I hope this resonates with you so that it bypasses your left brain, your critical analytical thinking mind. And I hope that you're, because the heart never lies. I hope it resonates with your heart, that you feel it in your heart. You know what? I don't understand it. I don't get it, but it sounds true. It resonates with me. You know, I feel like I remember. I remember or I realize or I understand or I comprehend this. I notice the truth of this um, as, you know, as the words that I speak, you become aware of my my intuitive cognizant abilities and your own intuition and your own knowingness. It rings true to you. Okay, moving on to the next section. The atom, fact and fiction. There we go, polarity again. So to help you understand how the quantum field is constructed, you first need to revisit the possibilities that exist inside the atom. And when we reduce matter to its tiniest, smallest unit of measurement, we get the atom. And the atom vibrates at a very high frequency and a very high rate. If we could peel back the atom like an orange, we find a nucleus, a subatomic particle such as protons, neutrons and electrons but for the most part we find that it's 99.9999 percent empty space or energy as you read earlier so take a look at figure 11.7 on the left we see the classical model of the atom that we were taught in grade school but this is in fact 
<laughs> newsflash, an outdated model. So in actuality, electrons don't move in fixed rotations around the nucleus like planets orbiting the sun. Instead, as you see on the right, the space around the nucleus is more like an invisible field or a cloud. It's like a cloud of information and has, and as we know, all information is made up of light frequency and energy. So to get an understanding of just how small these subatomic particles are, if the nucleus of an atom were increased to the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, the size of the electron would be equal to the size of a pea. Meanwhile, the space where the electron could exist would be 85,000 square miles. That's twice the size of Cuba. That's a lot of empty space for the electron to exist in. So the classic model of the atom with electrons rotating around the central nucleus in an orbit is outdated. Electrons exist as waves of probability in an invisible cloud of energy surrounding the nucleus. Therefore, the atom is mostly not matter. It's immaterial energy and very little matter. So according to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, we never know whether the electron is going to appear in the electron cloud, yet from nothing comes something. And so this is why quantum physics is so exciting and unpredictable. The electron is not always physical matter. Rather, it exists as the energy or as the probability of a wave. It is only through the act of observation by an observer that it appears. Once an observer, a mind, somebody's eyes connected to their mind and their brain is observing, comes along and looks for it, the act of observation, directed energy, because when you're looking at something and you're paying attention, your energy is going there. That causes all the potential energy to collapse into an electron, which is matter. Thus, it manifests from a realm of infinite possibilities and unknown to a known. So it becomes local in space and time in that moment. So when the observer is no longer observing it, the electron turns back into potential, into possibility. That's the wave function. In other words, it turns back into energy, returning to the unknown and to its own agenda. So when it turns back into energy and possibility, it becomes non-local. In the realm of quantum, mind and matter are indivisible. I'm going to repeat that. In the realm of 5D quantum, the mind and matter are indivisible. Therefore, if Newtonian physics in the world of the predictable, the quantum is the world of the unpredictable, to which sidebar, to which I say, thank God, thank the creator, thank 5D quantum, thank you, energy wave forms, thank you, the great I am, because that's how we're able to create new outcomes. So when we close our eyes in meditation, and we open our focus to infinite space. This is exactly what we are doing. We are putting more of our attention on energy, space, information, and possibility rather than on matter. We are becoming less aware of the material world and the material realm and more aware of the immaterial realm. We are investing our energy into the unpredictable and unknown and disinvesting our attention and energy from the predictable and the known. So each time we do this, we develop a deeper understanding of what the unified field is. So before we go any further, let's briefly review what we just learned. 
I want you to take a moment and review figure 11.8. And the three-dimensional Newtonian world is made of objects, people, places, matter, particles, and time. Basically, most of the nouns or everything we know in our external world. And in this world, there's more space and linear time. As a body, we use our senses to define this infinite space we live in, in a universe of form, structure, dimension, and density. This is the realm of the known and predictable. The summary of space-time in our 3D Newtonian world and the bridge that allows us to enter as consciousness into the realm of time-space in our 5D quantum world. A summary of the time-space 5D reality of the quantum world. So because we experience the material universe with our senses, our senses provide us with information that occurs as patterns in our brain which we recognize as structures. And it is through this process that things in our external environment become knowns. It is also through this process that we become a somebody, a someone with something in some place and in some time. Finally, because we experience the universe with our senses, we experience separation. And therefore, this is a realm of duality and polarity. So now review figure 11.9. If, if the Newtonian world is a material world defined by the five senses in the quantum world, the opposite is true. This is an immaterial world defined by non-sense. In other words, there is nothing sensory based here and there is no matter, whereas the Newtonian world is based on predictable knowns such as matter, particles, people, places, things, objects, and time. This is an unpredictable dimension made up of light, frequency, information, vibration, energy, and consciousness. So if our three-dimensional world is a dimension of matter, where there's more space than time, the quantum world is a dimension of anti-matter, a place where there's more time than space because there is more time than space all possibilities exist in the internal in the eternal present moment whereas the three-dimensional world is our universe meaning one reality the quantum world is a multiverse meaning many realities so if the space-time reality is based on separation then the immaterial quantum world or unified field is based on oneness, connectedness, wholeness, and unity, non-locality. So in order for us to go from our known space, time, to three-dimensional universe, a universe made up of matter where we experience duality and polarity to the unknown time-space, five-dimensional, multiverse, a place where there is no matter, but instead light, information and frequency, vibrational energy and consciousness. We have to cross a bridge. That bridge is the speed of light. When we become pure consciousness and become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, no time, we are crossing that bridge, that threshold from matter into energy. And when Einstein introduced the equation E equals MC squared in his theory of special relativity, for the first time in the history of science, he demonstrated from a mathematical standpoint that energy and matter are actually related. What converts matter to energy is the speed of light, which means anything material traveling faster than the speed of light leaves our three-dimensional reality and turns into immaterial energy. In other words, in the three-dimensional world, the speed of light is the threshold for matter or anything physical to retain its form. No thing can travel faster than the speed of light, not even information. Anything traveling from one point to another that is traveling slower than the speed of light is going to take time. Therefore, the fourth dimension 
is time. Time is the nexus that connects the three-dimensional world to the fifth-dimensional world and beyond. Okay, I'm going to pause right here. One of the things that came to me in meditation not too long ago, as a matter of fact, is that we're talking here about traveling at the speed of light. In fact, the way to travel between dimensions, the way to travel, to do, to do time traveling, past, present, or future, is through light. Light is the portal and the gateway in meditation for you to time travel. That's how you can go into the past or you can go into the future. And in fact, during, if you watch the video on my, my mystical experience that happened on March 22nd, one of the things that as they, as they finished with whatever they were sharing with me and doing to me in the sixth dimension, they had me, they said, okay, it's now time for you to go into the next dimension. The next, they called it the next dimension. And as soon as I said yes, I traveled through this like light vortex, I guess you could call it. And it was like traveling like feet first. It's kind of hard to describe. I was like going feet first and in a flash, I was in the next dimension, opened the door, and then I was told it was the seventh dimension because I didn't know where I was going, right? I'm just going with the flow. So make no mistakes. Traveling at the speed of light, time travel is done through light. That's how we go from one time and place into another time and place. And my friends, you can choose to go at any point in time through these meditations. That's the good news. And as you know, there's an infinite amount of possibilities as to what you can explore. Okay. Once something is traveling faster than the speed of light, there is no time or no separation between two points of consciousness because everything material becomes energy. This is how you go from three dimensions to five dimensions, from a universe to a multiverse, from this dimension to all dimensions. So let me give you an example to help simplify this complex idea. French physicist Alan Aspect. I always thought that was a funny name. Alan Aspect. Okay, moving on. French physicist Alan Aspect performed a famous quantum physics experiment in the early 1980s called the Bell Test Experiment. In the study, scientists entangled two photons, causing them to bond together. Then they shot the two photons in opposite directions, creating distance and space between them. When they influenced one photon to disappear, the other photon vanished at exactly the same time. This experiment was a cornerstone study in the breakthrough of quantum physics because it proved that Einstein's theory of relativity wasn't completely correct. What it showed was that there is a unifying field of information existing beyond three-dimensional space and time that connects all of the matter. So if the two particles of light were not connected by some invisible energy field, it would have taken time for the information to travel from one local point in space to the other local point in space. According to Einstein's theory, if one particle disappeared, the other particle should disappear a moment later, unless they were occupying the same space at the same time. So even if the second photon was affected a millisecond later because they were separated by space, time would have played a factor in relaying that information. This would have reaffirmed that the ceiling of this physical reality is the speed of light and everything material that exists here is separate because the two particles vanished at exactly the same time, it proved that all matter bodies, people, things, objects, places, and even time are connected by frequency and information in a realm beyond three-dimensional reality and time. So everything beyond the material world is unified in a state of oneness. So the information was communicated between those two photons, non-locally, 
since there's no separation between two points of consciousness in the 5D, five dimensional reality, there's no linear time. There is only all times. So mystical quantum physicist David Bohm called the realm of quantum the, the implicate order where everything is connected. He called the explicit order the material realm of separation. So if you look at figures 11.8 and 11.9 again, it'll help you get your mind around both of these worlds. So when you take your attention off being somebody, someone, something, somewhere, and sometime, and you become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, no time, you're becoming pure consciousness. Your consciousness then merges with the unified field, which is made only of consciousness and energy, where you connect to the self-organizing consciousness of everybody, everyone, everything, everywhere, and every time. Thus, as you surrender as an awareness without your senses into this field of oneness where there is no separation, and you keep going deeper into the void or the blackness, because nothing physical exists there, you, as a consciousness, become less separate from the consciousness of the unified field. If you can become, or if you can keep becoming more conscious and aware of it and keep paying attention to it, you are investing your energy in it and your attention directly at it. Thus, as you keep moving toward it, you will feel less separation and more wholeness. So finally, since only the eternal present moment exists in that unified field, because there is no linear time, only all time, the consciousness and energy of the unified field that is observing all matter into form is always in the present eternal moment. So therefore, in order for you to connect and unify with it, you will have to be completely in the present moment as well. If you review figure 11.10, it shows you how you can collapse your own separation and individual consciousness to experience the oneness and wholeness of the unified field. So one last point about the speed of light. In this realm of material world, visible light is a frequency based on polarity, electrons, positrons, photons, and so on. If you look ahead a bit at figure 11.11, .11, according to the scale, approximately one third of the way up from the slowest frequency is where the division of light takes place. So above this wave frequency is where matter goes from form to, to energy and singularity and below this frequency are division and polarity. So when the division of light takes place, photons, electrons, and positrons come into being because the visible light field holds the information template of matter as organized frequency in patterns of light. This division of light is where the Big Bang occurred, where singularity became duality and polarity, and where the universe eventually appeared as organized information and matter. And that's why this void is eternal blackness. There is no visible light. I'm going to pause right here for a second because sometimes when we are in meditation, Dr. Joe talks about this as well, but he talks about how sometimes you'll be in meditation and you'll see this fractal geometrical, almost kaleidoscope. Maybe it looks like a kaleidoscope ish type of um, energy that is moving in a particular, almost like a Fibonacci sequencing live thing. And that is a packet of information. That's what this is. This, what we just read right now is describing that, but we're seeing it in 5d as we're meditating. That's a packet of information that has an energy. It's actual, it's actually alive. And if you continue to, instead of trying to look at it, don't try to look at it because that's what happens to me. Every time I try to look at it, then it would disappear. So when you try to look at it and get a better, closer look at it in your mind's eye, it dissolves and goes away. So instead you just stay as the awareness, you're aware that it's there, that what you're seeing is good enough. And then you just say, yes, I surrender, I allow, I let go. I I'm willing to receive whatever it is 
you know, that the 5D has for me. And then that packet of information will, your pineal gland, what it will do is it will translate that packet of information into visual forms and more will then be revealed to you. More information, whatever it is that's perfect for you, because infinite source intelligence knows exactly what it is that you need, then that will be revealed to you. There's a certain amount of it, what I've come to learn just since that mystical experience that I had on the 22nd is, there are things that you will be consciously aware of that is revealed to you. And there's a whole boatload of stuff that you're not aware of that is also revealed to you, but it is put kind of into like a hibernation mode into your subconscious mind. And it's just sitting there, slowly moving, waiting for the perfect time when you're gonna need it. And then it'll bubble up so that when you need it, it's right there. And you don't know how oftentimes there are certain things, you're gonna know certain things, you're gonna have information where you've never studied certain things before and it's like vroom. And if you try to repeat it, you can't repeat it. So hopefully whoever is hearing on the other end, hopefully they're paying close attention or hopefully you're recording it because it's, you don't, you don't have a memory of it. So because you have no memory of it, that's why you can't repeat it. And it wasn't your original thought, which is again, why you can't repeat it. It needed to be said and expressed at that moment in time. And so boom, it'll bubble up. You're like, whoa, first of all, you don't talk that way. You don't language in that way. It's a different uh, way of expressing yourself. And so you will immediately recognize it's like, well, I, I couldn't possibly have known that. That's not how I speak. That's Those are terms I've never even heard of. Um, there's a foreign, uh, foreign type feeling about it. So, okay, we left off here at the Big Bang occurred where singularity became duality and polarity and where the universe eventually appeared as organized information and matter. So that's why this void is the eternal blackness. There is no visible light. So the more we live with our attention on the outer world, living as a somebody, being someone, owning something, living somewhere in some time in our 3D reality, the more we experience separation and lack. As we move our attention away from the outer world and toward the inner world, into our present moment, our consciousness aligns with its consciousness. Now we are present with it. As we surrender deeper into the unified field as a consciousness, we express less separation or lack and more oneness and wholeness. If there is no separation between two points of consciousness, then there's no space and no time, but all time and all spaces. Therefore, the more whole we feel and the less lack we experience, the more we feel like our future has already happened. And now we are no longer creating from duality, but now from oneness. So because matter vibrates at such a slow frequency, material things vibrate at a slow frequency to enter time space dimension or the unified field you can't enter as a body or matter so you must become nobody you can't take your identity so you're going to have to become no one you can't take things so you must become no thing you can't be somewhere so you're going to have to get to nowhere. Finally, if you're living by a familiar past or predictable future where time appears linear to get to the place of time space, you're going to have to experience no time. So how do you do this? You keep placing your attention on the unified field, not within your five senses, but within your awareness. And as you change your consciousness, you raise your energy. The more you become aware of this invisible field, the more you're moving further away from separation of matter and closer to oneness. So now you are in the quantum or the unified field. This is the realm of information that connects everybody. 
everyone, everything, everywhere, and every time. So I'm going to show you guys really quickly something that's very unique. Um, I don't know how many of you who are watching this have gotten Go Love 20. If you have Go Love 20, please put it in the comments below. If you haven't gotten Go Love 20, if you don't know what Go Love 20 is, then the answer is no. Then you don't have Go Love 20, which means that you still remain to be affected, which is a good thing. And if you have Go Love 20, then you're busy affecting others with Go Love 20. But what I wanted to share with you is one of the things as you do this work, obviously, because you're one with the one and you are the one, your ability to be clairsentient, clairvoyant, clair, clair, audience, um, all your clairs increase your psychic ability. I hate to use the word psychic because some people have a negative connotation towards that world, that, that language or that, that label, because it is a label, but you're basically because you're one with the one you receive information that's not your own and you're, you're sensitive to that information and you're, you're able to relay it. So for example, I had a gal who texted me. Let me see if I can show you. Actually today she texted me. So her question to me was, did you create that text just for me or did you send that same one to everyone? Fine either way, but it was so accurate, I became curious. So then I responded to her. Hi, Ariana. I always meditate before I send the text so I hear what the divine tells me to message you. So you are the only one who's ever seen that text. It's unique for you. I'm glad it, you resonated with it. I'm glad it resonated with you and you are aware and realize its accuracy. And I recognize we connected through Dr. Joe's work. Uh, love you a bunch. I shed a lot of tears during my meditation for you. You are amazing. And then she replied, ah, oh, thank you, my beautiful. I'm so touched by the care you've shown me. So that is just showing you an example how we do this work. We are really one with the one. There's, you know, you don't have to believe it. It's, it's a fact as, as true as gravity. You don't have to believe in gravity to be subject to the laws of gravity, to benefit from the benefits of gravity. It's there. Get over it. So I'm just sharing this with you to show you what is there, which is already there for you. It's already your body's already programmed with all of this. All you have to do is now just decide to take the steps and just do the practice because it is a practice. It's something that you're going to practice forever while you're on this earth plane using this meat suit. You will continue to practice this. And as you continue to practice, the good news is that you'll always be getting better and better. Okay. The unified field, becoming everybody, everyone, everything, everywhere, and every time. I just love that. Matter is very dense. And because of its density, it vibrates at the slowest frequency in the universe. Figure 11.11, .11, you see that as you raise matter's frequency by speeding it up faster and faster, matter as we know, it dematerializes into energy. And I read that again because this is a powerful moment in this chapter, chapter 11. Make no mistakes. And they're talking about figure 11.11. .11. So I want you to recognize what they just said here. What Dr. Joe, matter is very dense, like your cell phone is very dense. And because of its density, it vibrates at the slowest of frequencies in the entire universe. So in figure 11.11, .11, you see that as you raise matter's frequency by speeding it up faster and faster, matter as we know it dematerializes into energy. For example, your body dematerializes or for example, remember we were talking about the one inch thick piece of plywood or whatever kind of wood you want to call that? It dematerializes as you take your focused intention to put your hand through it. It's solid before you do that. But as you focus on the space that is inherent to that piece of wood, you're turning it, you're making it dematerialize so that you can, in fact, put your hand through that you dematerialize so you can dare i say i know it to be true dare i say 
You walk on water. Dare I say, you dematerialize where you can walk through a wall. Now, I'm going to be the first to tell you, I've never walked through a wall. I've never walked on water. I've had some pretty other extraordinary, supernatural, of biblical proportion manifestations, but walking on water and walking through walls hasn't been, hasn't been one of them. But from a physics perspective and from the perspective of the ancient, secret, mystical teaching, teachings, this dematerialization is without a shadow of a doubt possible, okay? And you, my friend, who are looking at this right now, I'm looking at you straight in the eye. You can do this. You've got this. Make no mistakes. This is not an accident that you are reading, watching, studying, and applying this work. It is on purpose, on time, with the right people at the right place. Okay? So at some point, just beyond the visible light spectrum above the realm of duality and polarity, any information about matter converts to more unified energy. So as you can see, the higher the frequency, the more orderly and coherent that energy becomes. And at this level of frequency and energy, duality and polarity unify to become one. We call this love or wholeness because there is no longer any division or separation. It is where positive and negative join, where male and female unite, where the past and the future merge, where good and bad no longer exist where right and wrong no longer apply, where opposites become one. So as you continue up this scale away from matter and separation, you continue to experience greater and greater degrees of wholeness, order and love. The orderliness of this more coherent energy is carrying information and that Information is more and more love. So if you continued speeding matter faster and faster, eventually it would be vibrating so fast as a frequency that it would exist as a straight line. Infinite frequencies exist in that line, which means infinite possibilities exist there as well. This is the zero point field or the point of singularity of the quantum and omnipresent ubiquitous field of information that exists as energy and frequency that is observing all of reality into order from a single point. We could call this the mind of God, unity consciousness, source energy, or whatever nomenclature you want to use to define the self-organizing principle of the universe. This is the place where all potentials or possibility exist as a thought. The ultimate source of a loving intelligence and an intelligent love that is observing all of this physical reality into form. I'm gonna pause here. It's what I call infinite source intelligence. Some people call it God the creator, the great I am, but I think you get the picture. Okay. So therefore, everything starts from a conscious thought. As conscious thought slows down in frequency, it slows down the energy until ultimately it takes on form and becomes matter. At the frequency of the speed of light, the pattern of all matter is reflected as a template to become structure. So, it is at the speed of light that energy divides into polarity or duality and electrons, positrons, etc., are then created. Above the speed of light, there are greater degrees of order that reflect as greater degrees of wholeness. So as we journey in consciousness from matter and get beyond ourselves, 
turning our attention inward toward the unified field, once we cross the plane of visible light, we become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, and no time. It is this realm that we experience, experience. So it is this realm that we experience as awareness of other dimensions, other realities, and other possibilities. Since frequency carries information and there are infinite frequencies in the quantum, we can experience other planes that exist there. So if you look at the arrows moving from matter towards the unified field, the top straight line representing all possibilities, you will see that you must journey through the lower frequencies between matter and light, which are different levels of thoughts and emotions. Look at the different levels of consciousness that you have to pass through to arrive at oneness and you will understand why most never make the journey. The greater the frequency we experience, the greater the energy. That's first bullet point. Second bullet point. The greater the energy, the greater the information we have to access to. Third bullet point. The greater the information, the greater the consciousness. Fourth bullet point. The greater the consciousness, the greater the awareness. Fifth bullet point. The greater the awareness, the greater the mind. Sixth bullet point, the greater the mind, the greater ability we have to affect matter. So in the hierarchy of universal laws, quantum laws trump Newtonian or classical laws. This is why Einstein said, the field is the sole governing agency of the particle. So the quantum field governs, organizes and unifies all the laws of nature and is always directing energy into order by patterning light into form. On our own planet, we need only look at nature to see how Fibonacci's sequence, otherwise known as the golden ratio, a reoccurring mathematical formula found throughout nature that brings about order and coherence, brings order to matter. So it's the zero point field made of possibilities or thought because thoughts are possibilities that is slowing its frequency down, creating order and form. So the unified field is a self-organizing intelligence that is always observing the material world into order and form. The more you can surrender to it, move closer to it and become one with it, the less separation and lack you feel and thus the more wholeness and oneness you're going to experience. So when you, as an awareness, unfold into this infinite realm of possibilities, you begin to feel connected to the consciousness of everyone, everybody, everywhere, everything, and every time, including your future dreams. So since consciousness is awareness and awareness is paying attention, the first step to experiencing the unified field is to become aware of it. Because if you're not aware of it, it doesn't exist. So the, thus, the more you pay attention to this field, the more you will become aware of it. There is a little caveat, however. As we've seen, the only way you can enter the realm of pure consciousness is to become pure consciousness. In other words, the only way to enter this kingdom of thought is as a thought. So this means you have to get beyond your senses by taking your awareness, by taking your awareness of matter, so you're gonna take it off of matter and particles, and instead, you're gonna place it on the energy or the waves. If you can unfold as an awareness into this unseen and material world, if you can unfold as an awareness into this unseen immaterial realm of infinite blackness and become aware that you are an awareness in the presence of a greater awareness, your consciousness will merge with the greater consciousness. So if you can do this, if you can get out of the way and linger as a consciousness or awareness in this field, if you can keep surrendering to this intelligent love, the same innate intelligence that's creating the universe, giving you life, 
it's going to consume you. This loving intelligence is both personal and universal within you and all around you. And when it consumes you, it's going to create and restore order and balance in your biology because its very nature is to organize matter in a more coherent way. So now you are moving through the eye of the needle and on the other side of the eye, there is no longer the separation of two points of consciousness. There is one consciousness or oneness. This is where all the possibilities exist because you are entering the domain of conscious thought, information, energy, and frequency. The bridge that gets you from space time to time space is going from being somebody, someone, something, someplace, and some time to being nobody, no one, nothing, nowhere, no time. This is the nexus, the threshold, to the unified quantum field. So go back and review figures 11.8 and 11.9. In this realm of infinite unknown possibilities, unlimited new potentials and experiences await you, not the same old familiar ones that you've experienced time and time again. After all, it isn't that what the unknown is. An unknown is just a possibility that exists to you as a new thought. When you are in this realm of pure thought, as a thought, the only thing limiting you is your imagination. But when in this realm of thought, if you find yourself thinking again about someone, something, somebody, somewhere in some known time, your awareness and thus your energy is back in the known reality of three-dimensional space and time back to the realm of separation. So since every thought you think has become a frequency, the moment you start thinking about the pain in your body or the advancement of your disease or the problems at work or the issues you have with your mother or the things you must do with a certain, within a certain amount of time, you are back in the space and time. Your awareness is, the, is back in the realm of the material in the material world and your thoughts are producing the same frequency equal to matter and particles. So review figure 11.10. Your energy is back to vibrating at the same level of the known physical world of three-dimensional reality so you exert less of an effect on your personal reality. You are back to vibrating as matter and we now know how that goes of course. So as your frequency moves farther and farther into density, you are moving farther and further away from the unified field. And as a result, you feel separate from it. In this scenario, if your dreams exist as thoughts in the unified field, it's going to take a lot of time for your dreams to come true. So if you're thinking about somebody, someone, something at some place in some time, you are not getting beyond your identity, which has been shaped by the totality of your past experiences. You are literally still in the same memories, habitual thoughts and conditioned emotions that you've associated with all the familiar people and things at certain times and places in your own known reality, which means your attention and energy are bound to your past present personal reality. So you're thinking equal to your identity. So your life is going to stay the same. You're the same personality trying to create a new personal reality. So when I say you have to get beyond yourself, it means to forget about yourself. Take your attention off your personality and your past personal reality. It makes sense then that to heal your body, you're going to have to get beyond your body. To create something new in your life, you're going to have to forget about your same old life. To change some problem in your external environment, you're going to have to get beyond your memory and the corresponding emotions related to that problem. And if you want to create a new unexpected event in your future timeline, 
you'll have to stop unconsciously anticipating the same predictable future based on your familiar memories of the past. So you're going to have to move to a greater level of awareness and consciousness than the consciousness that created any of those realities. So in a unified field where there is nowhere to go because you are everywhere, there is no thing you can want because you are so whole and complete that you feel like you have everything. You can't judge anyone because you are everyone and it's no longer necessary to become anybody because you are everybody and why would you be worried that there is never enough time if you exist in a domain where there's infinite time so the more whole you feel the less lack you experience and therefore the less you want how can you want or live in lack when you feel whole if there is less lack well, if there is less lack, there is less of a need to create from duality, polarity, and separation. How can you want when you're whole? When you create from wholeness, you feel like you already have it, and there is no longer wanting, trying, wishing, forcing, predicting, fighting, or hoping. After all, hope is a beggar. When you create from a state of wholeness, there are only knowing and observing. This is the key to manifesting, my friends. This is the key to manifesting reality, being connected, not separate. If time in your three-dimensional world is created by the illusion of space between two objects or two points of consciousness, then the more one you are with the unified field, the less separation there is between you and everything material. When your consciousness merges or becomes more connected to the unified field, to the realm of wholeness and unity, there's no longer separation between two points. Those two points of consciousness. This is wholeness. This wholeness is then reflected in your biology, chemistry, circuitry, hormones, genes, heart, and brain, thus restoring balance to your entire system. A greater frequency or energy is now moving through your autonomic nervous system, a system that continuously gives you life and whose agenda it is to create balance and order. This energy is carrying a message of wholeness and as a result, you become more holy, the greater the frequency you experience, the shorter the amount of time it takes to unfold in this three-dimensional space-time reality. So as we learned earlier in this chapter, when you diminish the space between two points of consciousness, you collapse time. So when this illusion of separation no longer exists, you perceive less space between you and identity living in a body, in a physical environment, in a linear time, and people, objects, things, places, matter, and even your dreams. Therefore, the closer you move to the unified field, the more connected you feel you are to everyone and everything. So you as a consciousness are in the realm of oneness. And because there is no separation, time is eternal. And remember, when there is infinite time, there are infinite spaces, possible dimensions and realities to be experienced. So wherever you think you are or whoever you think you are, you are. In fact, there is nothing to try to create because it already exists as a thought in the realm of all thoughts. All you have to do is become aware of it and observe it into being by experiencing it. Once we become the consciousness of everyone, everybody, everything, everywhere, and every time, from a theoretical standpoint, we can create anybody, anyone, anything, anywhere, have anything, live anywhere, and be in any time. So take a peek at figure 11.12 to follow along.
as you do this and move your attention from being somebody to being nobody to becoming everybody, you can create anybody. As you move from living as someone to becoming no one to being everyone, you can become anyone. As you can take your attention off of something, move into the realm of no thing, you merge with everything. Thus, you can have anything. As you move your awareness from somewhere to nowhere, you will be everywhere and you can live anywhere. And finally, when you shift your consciousness from some time to no time to becoming every time, you can be in any time. Now that's becoming supernatural. In the work I do around the world, I have labored for many years teaching our students how to get beyond themselves. I now know the first step in this process is for them to, to master their body, get beyond the conditions in their external environment and transcend time. And when they accomplish that, they find themselves on the precipice of experiencing the unified field. Once they arrive at this nexus, However, they must be taught that there is even more to experience. I hit the pause button again because, like I said before, you are in the realm of infinity. Things can get infinitely worse. Things can get infinitely better. But now that you're aware on how to do this work, now in the face of something unwanted, you go, oh, nope, don't want that. Don't like that. Ooh, ouch. Okay, hit the pause button literally hit the pause button and now you slow down your heart rate slow down your breath slow down your brain waves and now you go into that meditative process because you are going to tap into the quantum field and you're going to go from particles you're going to go into the energy waveforms and you're going to make those energy waveforms where there's that 99.9 .9 space and then you've got the energy waveforms and you're going to turn those waveforms into the particles that you want and you're going to mold the clay. You're going to mold the energy into that which it is that you want. So if learning means making new synaptic connections, remember Kandel said, habits, you use 1300 neurological pathways of the brain. But when you learn something new like this, now you're using 2600 neurological pathways. You have more neurons firing and wiring, linking and singing together you're actually becoming more intelligent as you're reading this book and you're learning these concepts and you're applying them. So if learning means making new synaptic connections, the more you learn about something, the more you, be, you, you come to appreciate it and you become aware of it and experience it because now you can engage it with a new set of neural networks. It is in the act of learning that you further change or enrich your experience after all. If you haven't learned anything new, your experience will probably stay in the same, will stay the same since you're perceiving reality with the same neural circuitry as before. Knowledge is the harbinger, harbinger that evolves your experience. I'm gonna say that again. Knowledge is the harbinger that evolves your experience. So for example, I love red wine, so do I. And I led several wine tours a year in different parts of the world. Many people who come to these week-long events initially tell me that they know nothing about wine. How I translate this statement is that they probably never learned anything about or have had the, ex the limited exposure to the fermented grape. So the truth of the matter is that because they have limited knowledge and experience from their past, they have very limited neural hardware installed to perceive any real taste or nuance. So we could say then that they just don't know what to look for to truly enjoy the experience. So, but what if they learn how winemakers produce wine and understand its history, the type of grapes they use and why they are used. Then they learn about how the wine is stored in oak barrels for how long and why. This would familiarize it would familiarize them with the whole process and reasoning as to what makes a particular wine so enjoyable. So that's the process. But now we think of that great wine in the bottle. If they are not aware of the plum flavor, the notes of black cherry and currants, its hints of vanilla and leather, the smell of its floral patterns, floral perfumes, its percentage of tannins, 
whether it was aged in oak barrels or stainless steel drums, and for how long, then they don't know what to look for. For, and they are not going to be able to fully experience it. Only in the moment when they know what to look for and what to become aware of, does it exist? We could say then that their awareness changes their experience. So I know this to be true because just in just one week, those same people who initially said they didn't like red wine or knew nothing about it, walk away with a whole new experience of interacting with it. After many full days of learning and discovering what to look for repeatedly, staying present and focusing all their awareness on specific flavors and aromas day after day, experiencing all types of wines and deciding what they like and don't like, continuously paying attention and therefore firing, wiring and assembling new neural connections, those folks get very specific about what type of wine they like. So in one week, they gain a whole new level of appreciation, awareness, and understanding. Again, the experience changed them. The same is true when it comes to the unified field. If you're not aware of it, then it doesn't exist for you. Yet the more you know about it, and the more you're aware that you are of what to look for, the more you can pay attention to it with your awareness and experience it. And you experience it more deeply. So it should change you. So starting at birth, you're trained to keep your attention on matter, not energy. You are conditioned into believing you need your senses to experience reality. So in other words, if you don't see, hear, feel, smell, touch, or taste something, it doesn't exist. Because of this, the majority of people place most of their attention on matter, objects, and particle while taking very little time to put their attention on energy, information, and the wave. So for, exen for, ex for instance, you are not aware of your big toe on your left foot until you put your attention on it. It has, it has a little tongue tied here, aren't I? <laughs> it has always existed for you, but you were unaware of it. The moment you put your awareness on it, however, it becomes into being. The same is true for the unified field. The more you become aware of it, the more it will exist in your reality. By focusing solely on matter, people ex exclude the possibility from their life. That's when the wave is an energy of possibility. The more you pay attention to it, the more possibilities should show up in your life. Because wherever you place your attention, is where you place your energy. The moment you become aware of the unified field, your attention upon it causes it to expand. So for example, when you place your attention and your awareness on your pain, it expands because you experience more of it. If you keep attending to your pain and experiencing more and more of it, it becomes a part of your life. The same thing also happens with the unified field. When you place your attention on it and become more aware of it, it expands. And just as I said about pain, when you experience more of it, it exists as a part of you in your life. So simply by placing your attention on the unified field, as you become aware of it, notice it, experience it, feel it, interact with it, and stay present with it, moment after moment, it shows up and unfolds in your re reality on a daily basis. So how does it show up and unfold? as unknowns, serendipities, synchronicities, opportunities, coincidences, luck, being in the right place at the right time, and moments filled with awe. In my best description from experience, this unified field is a divine loving intelligence and an intelligent love that is within and around you. So each time you focus your attention on it, you are becoming aware of the presence of the divine within and all around you. As you place your attention on it, the divine should appear more in your life since consciousness is awareness and awareness is paying attention. When you are aware of it and you pay attention to it, you begin to merge with it. Your experience of it will literally cause you 
to become it. And as you unfold deeper and deeper into the unified field, there's more and more of you. And there's more and more for you to explore and experience. So if you look at figure 11.11 .11 again, as you move closer and closer to that straight line, that represents source energy or oneness. It makes sense that the only way you can move closer to it is by keeping your attention on it and becoming more conscious of it. If you do this correctly as you journey away from duality or separation and towards unity and oneness, since feelings are the end product of an experience, you should feel more and more levels of love, unity, and wholeness. Once you feel an experience, more of this intelligent love, three things happen in your life. The first thing is that as you place your attention and awareness on the unified field, as you move closer to source and deeper into it, you experience more of it. That journey carves a neurological path from your thinking brain straight to your autonomic nervous system. Now each time you venture deeper into it, as you slow your brain waves down, you're building a neurological highway with more lanes and the neural pathway becomes thicker because you are using it more. So over time, this enables you to more easily merge with the field. The second thing, number two, that happens is that because experience enriches the brain, each time you interact with this unified field and experience it, your brain changes. This is what experience does. It enriches and refines brain circuitry. Now you are installing the hardware in your brain to be more aware of this field the next time you merge with it. Likewise, since experience produces an emotion as you feel the unified field, you begin to embody it. Thus you embody more of the divine. So according to the quantum model of reality, since all disease is a lowering of incoherency of frequency, the moment the body experiences this new coherent elevated frequency, the energy from that event raises the body's vibration into coherence and order. So numerous times in our advanced workshops around the world, when our students' bodies have been upgraded by a new frequency and new information, we've witnessed instantaneous changes in their health. Since the autonomic nervous system's agenda is to create balance and health, the instant we get out of its way, stop analyzing, cease thinking and fully surrender, this intelligence steps in and it creates order. But this time, it's carrying newer, more self-organizing message with a greater frequency from the unified field. That very same coherent energy raises the frequency of matter. It's life-changing. The frequency of a static-filled radio station to one that is carrying a clear frequency and signal. The body is receiving a more coherent signal. Now, when this happens, you will feel intense love, a profound joy for existence, a heightened sense of freedom, indescribable bliss, and offer life elevated levels of gratitude, and a humbled sense of true empowerment. In that moment, the energy from the unified field in the form of emotion is reconditioning your body to a new mind, to a new consciousness, and a new mind. In a heartbeat, the elevated emotions signal new genes in new ways, changing your body and moving it out of your biological past. So the third thing that happens as you move closer towards the unified field is that you begin to hear or experience knowledge and information directly. And that's because you've changed your brain circuits and are no longer the same person. You will meet truth on a whole new level. So you will meet truth on a whole new level and things that you thought you knew will seem like a brand new encounter. Your inner experience has changed your perception of what is happening in your outer world. And in other words, you've awakened. So once you have an experience, a feeling or a better understanding of the unified field, once it changes your brain's circuitry, it allows you to experience and perceive reality in new ways. So in fact, 
you will see a spectrum of life that your brain did not have the circuitry to perceive before. So the next time your brain fires those networks, you already have the hardware to experience even more of the reality. You are now perceiving more of a reality that, that has always existed. You merely lacked the circuits to perceive it previously. So if on a consistent basis, you can make this journey all the way to source, see figure 11.11 .11 again, and connect with it, the moment you truly interact with it, you will begin to behave more like it. Its nature becomes your nature. And now more intelligent love is being expressed through you. What are its innate qualities? You will become more patient, forgiving, present, conscious, aware, willful, giving, selfless, loving, and mindful to name, but a few of them. You realize that which you have been seeking is seeking you. You become it and it becomes you. The discipline then is to allow your consciousness to merge with a greater consciousness. Two, surrender deeper into intelligent love. Three, trust in the unknown. Four, continuously surrender some aspect of the limited self to join the greater self. Five, lose yourself in nothing to become everything. Six, relax into an infinite deep sea of coherent energy. Seven, keep unfolding deeper and deeper into oneness. Eight, continuously let go of control. Nine, feel greater and greater degrees of wholeness. And finally, 10, as a consciousness moment by moment, become aware, pay attention to experience, Experience, be present with and feel more and more of this unified feel all around you without returning your awareness back to the three-dimensional reality. If you do this properly, you won't be using any of your senses because you're beyond your senses. You'll simply be awareness. Space, time, time, space meditation. So you're gonna begin by resting your awareness on your heart. And once you are locked in on the space, your heart occupies in space, become aware of your breathing. Allow it to flow in and out of your heart. All the while deepening and relaxing your breath. So allow it to flow in and out of your heart all, all the time, deepening and relaxing your breath keeping your attention on your heart. Call up an elevated emotion and sustain this feeling for a period of time while paying attention to your breathing. Radiate that energy beyond your body in space. Next, using any song that inspires you like the one you used for the meditation in chapter five, do that meditation to pull the mind out of the body. Take all the energy stored in your body. So you're taking all the energy stored in your body as survival emotions and liberate it into elevated emotions using a level of intensity that is greater than the body as a mind. So for the next 10 to 15 minutes, listen to one or two songs without lyrics that will induce trans. Now become pure consciousness, becoming no one, nobody, no thing, nowhere in no time, unfolding as an awareness into the unified field. Now it's time to become connected to the consciousness of everyone, everybody, everything, everywhere, in every time, unifying with a greater consciousness in the unified field. All you have to do is become aware of the field. Pay attention to it. Stay present with it and feel it moment by moment. You will begin to feel more wholeness and oneness, which will be reflected in your biology because your body is experiencing more coherent energy moving through it. And you are building your energy field. 
You're gonna maintain this state for about 10 to 20 minutes, surrendering deeper and deeper into it. When you're done, bring your awareness back to a new body, to a new environment, and to a whole new time. Chapter 11 was a long chapter, but there is a lot of great information in there. That's it. I am so happy and glad that you tuned in, tapped in, turned on to Love and Money Secrets TV. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please make sure you put them in the comments below. I do my best to respond to everybody right away. Uh, I love, absolutely adore to hear from you all and, and make sure to catch up with us tomorrow at 9 p.m. when we dive in deep into chapter 12. It's getting juicy because we're going to be talking about the pineal gland in the next one. So ciao for now.